one of the interesting things about the those archaeological discoveries which have revealed that the curtain playhouse was rectangular and had some other features that really don't sit well with our established narratives. Here's the interesting thing, though. So the curtain's rectangular and we might then go like, oh, yeah, yeah, but that's weird because we know all these other wooden O's. We know the standard shape of an early modern playhouse is polygonal slash round. Well, that makes the indoor playhouses, all of which were rectangular, look like a different thing, right? Like a different genre of performance venue. But of course, that's only true if you think that the normative shape of an outdoor playhouse is polygonal. The other big archaeological dig that happened with less fanfare than the curtain was the discovery of the, of the Red Lion uh, from the 1560s, which is also rectangular. Um, and you then they pile up. If you list all the rectangular playing spaces that we know of, um, after 1600, which also includes the Fortune Playhouse in North London, which is a, perp a, a built from completely from scratch as a, as a square, in fact, structure. Um, and if you then go back into the 1570s and listen to Andy Kesson, who's been insisting for years now that we have to take the inns seriously as, as, as venues, well, those yards were also rectangular. And um, maybe unevenly shaped, but definitely, definitely not polygonal in any recognizable sense. And suddenly you sort of get to the point where you might think, oh, well, maybe when James Burbage built the theater in North London in 1575 or six or thereabouts, and he built the bloody thing in a polygonal shape and called it the theater, he was doing that as a marketing stunt because to make it look different from all the mm -hmm. other existing playhouses. Mm -hmm. And maybe that stunt took for a few, for, for, for one generation of playhouses. And then you have Henslow at the Rose copying that shape. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have um, the Swan also on the South Bank copying that shape, but making it bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have the Burbages and a few members of the Chamberlain's men taking the timber from the theater and carrying it across the river and building the globe from it and building the globe polygonally. But of course they would, because they have all these little pieces of timber. They're not going to make as a rectangular structure out of that. <laughs> um, but that's where it ends. Like the globe in 1599 is the last polygonal playhouse. And you could argue that it's not polygonal because they wanted a polygonal playhouse, but because that's the timber they had. And when it burns down in 1613 and they rebuild it, well, they have the foundations. They can't really, like, it would be much more expensive to, to tear those down and reinvent them as rectangular. But basically every polygonal playhouse after the Swan, that's 1594, every polygonal playhouse has, is basically has its hand forced into that shape. It's not that shape um, for, 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 uh, with, without sort of constraint. We're dealing with scholars who are heavily invested in the roundness of the theater. And so this yes. is very bad after you have publications and you make sort of a reputation and that's part of your reputation. It's very bad to learn that this theater wasn't shaped the way uh, or that that wasn't the <laughs> primary shape. And also, if you're in, if you're a director, if you're someone trying to get a sense of how or recreate how plays were acted, how they were done, this changes everything. This is uh, this is the shape how actors are blocked where they enter, where the tiring house was, if it was at all, whether they just had to dive behind yeah. a curtain. And it matters to actors and directors and theater people, uh, even now when they're trying to re-envision how to, to do a, a stage play, depending on what kind of space they are afforded. And oh, massively, yeah. massively, right? And you, of course, I mean, it's and, and of course, it's not just like I mean, you might publish a few articles that sort of in, envisage, say, the globe a certain way, and then it turns out it's not like that way. It's not that way. Well, okay, so you have to revise yourself. Not, not that bad. It happens, right? New data is discovered. You change your, you, you, you revise your hypothesis. That's just good critical thinking and scientific method and what have you, right? That's what we're supposed to do. I think it's somewhat different if you've actually built an enormous building based <laughs> on that assumption. That would be the, then, the, um, the modern 
a globe. Yes. Is, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> well, let's no, talk no, about let's talk about that a bit. The sure. modern globe sure. theater. Uh, beloved. But, I mean, it's mini. basically. Oh no no! And it's a, you know I love it as a performance space, but it's definitely too big. The modern globe reconstruction in London was already being conceived and had advanced quite far when the found when a small section of the foundations of the actual globe was unearthed. Um, and then began a fairly involved um, effort on the part of the theater historians associated with the globe, re the reconstructed globe, to explain away those archaeological findings. Um, and to and, and, and to basically argue that, well, they could still be compatible with the size of building that, they, that we are building. Uh, as far as I can tell, there isn't a single archaeologist who believes that the thing, that the, the bits of, of brick and mortar they found at the location of the original globe um, could be uh, interpreted as part of a 20-sided polygon, which is what the modern globe is. They're either 16 or 18 and more likely 16, which is a considerably smaller building than the modern globe. And that, of course raises all kinds of issues, right? It raises issues about the relationship between the audience and the actors. It raises questions about acoustics. It raises questions about light because a larger polygon obviously admits more light than a smaller polygon. It raises questions about the size of the stage and what kind of stage could be reasonably accommodated in that smaller uh, polygon and so on. If we think of it as, a, as something like a, like a lab, where you can put on theater historical experiments and see how they would have worked in the original globe, well, it's a lab in which the Bunsen burners are at the wrong temperature and your test tubes are made of too brittle glass or something like that. It's the, 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 the materials you're working with are contaminated, so you can't, you, you can't, you, you're never gonna uh, have the, the result in the experiment that corresponds to any kind of historical reality. The people at the Globe always get really mad at me when I say, but it's a great theater, and great performances take place there. But I really, because they think it's condescending, but I don't mean it that way. I really think that. I, mean, I, I think it's an awesome theater. It's one of my favorite theaters in London. Um, it's just not, it's just not Shakespeare's Globe. It's ours. 